Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good to uh, good to see you. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we're going to be uh, looking at a uh, particular episode uh, in the uh, history of the community. Um, <clears throat> uh, continuing on the series that we've been doing and looking at uh, different uh, things that have happened within the history of the Spanish and Portuguese that relate to uh, the uh, story of Pesach. Um, and the story that we're going to look at uh, tonight um, is a, uh, a story of controversy surrounding the reading of the Torah on the seventh day of Pesach. Um, on the seventh day of Pesach, we uh, read the Shirat Hayam, the uh, song at the sea. Uh, of course, the splitting of the sea, and then the song is the people passed through the waters and, and were saved, um, <clears throat> and they sang the Az Yashir. Um, and it is uh, sung according to a special melody in the synagogue, the Hain Neum, as it's called, which we use for other special uh, occasions. Uh, and normally it's a point of celebration and a wonderful reading. Uh, we, we do it twice a year on, on the seventh day of Passover, which commemorates the, that moment in the story of the Exodus, right? So we begin the Exodus at the, the first day of Passover with the leaving, and then seven days later, they got to the sea, they were stuck between right, the water and the Egyptians, and they thought they were gonna die, but the water split, they were able to pass through, and then the Egyptians followed in, the waters collapsed uh, over them, and they were, uh, they were rescued. Um, and so it's something which is uh, celebrated on that seventh day of Pesach, and we also read it during the annual cycle of the Torah reading as well, in the Pirashav Bishalach, uh, which we always, is around January time, uh, typically. And so uh, <clears throat> uh, normally it was, as I mentioned, a time of celebration, um, but that was not to be the case in 1827, uh, when a big feud uh, broke out in the Spanish and Portuguese community here in London um, about that reading. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up a, um, <clears throat> the psukim, the verses uh, about which the reading, uh, about which the, the debate uh, broke out. Okay. And so these are the verses that we say, and these, these verses are actually read after the split, after the, the song at the sea, after the Az Yashir, but are part of that reading uh, nonetheless. And it says that uh, Moses caused Israel to set out from the Sea of Reeds. They went into the wilderness of shore. They traveled three days in the wilderness and found no water. They came to Marah, but they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. That is why it was called Mara, which means bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water and the water became sweet. There he made for them a fixed rule and there he put them to a test, Visham and Saul. And so this is the story of uh, the uh, Mara. We had these, uh, the, uh, uh, the, these bitter waters uh, the, the Mara that happened there. And the debate was about the way that the words were meant to be pronounced. And so I'll read the first verse here in Hebrew. It says, Vayasa Moshe Yisrael Miyamsuf, that Moses traveled Israel from the Sea of Reeds, Vayetzeu El Midbar Shor, and they went to the to the desert of Shor, right? And they traveled for three days, Bamidbar in the desert, and they did not find water. And it was particularly about these words over here, that they uh, that they debate actually uh, broke out. Um, because the question was, is how do you pronounce the Shiva, the two dots underneath this sadi. Is it what's called a shiva not, a resting shiva, which would mean that the way the word would be pronounced is mats, right? That the shiva means the end of one syllable, or is this a shiva now, which means a sh moving shiva, right? Which would mean that it would be a, uh, a shiva that uh, is, is a vowel itself, right? So it would be three syllables, ma. Se, ooh, right? And that was exactly what the debate was about. Um, the, uh, what, what happened on that particular year is that usually the Chacham of the community would read the special readings. Um, the Chacham was Chacham Rafael Meldala, the, the 
fell with the cape <laughs> over here on the left side. Um, and uh, but it was, the year was 1827. He'd been the CUNY for several decades and was, was ill that year. He actually dies the following year in 1828. Um, so he wasn't able to read. Uh, and so in his place, the first Chazan of the community read. Um, his name was Yitzchak Almosnino, uh, Isaac Almosnino, um, and he did the uh, reading. The, the second Chazan, maybe see reference to him later, was uh, the son-in-law of Meldala, um, David Aaron de Sola, who would later become the head Chazan of the community and is a well-known historic figure. But the head Chazan was Almosnino, and so it was his job that Chacham couldn't do the reading, that he would do it uh, instead. And so uh, he did the reading, um, and this was in Bishalach, right? So this was already in January time that the Chacham couldn't come to synagogue. Uh, and he read it, not Matzu, but he read it Matzu. Uh, and so <clears throat> the uh, uh, Chacham heard, and uh, before the seventh day of Passover, he sent a message to uh, Amos Nino that he should make sure that on the seventh day of Passover, he reads it uh, the way that the Chacham wanted him to, which is as a Shiva, not a moving Shiva, a syllabical uh, Shiva, uh, which would be Ma Se U. Uh, apparently, when the uh, Chazan got up to that word in the reading, he said in a very long, loud voice, Velo Mats U, right? He really emphasized the fact that he was reading it as a Shiva Nach. Um, and so Mats U. Um, and the uh, Chacham was quite upset about this, uh, and, uh, and a, whole, a whole debate uh, uh, broke out. Um, now, what exactly was this uh, debate um, uh, about, right? What really was happening with all of this uh, fight? So it was a question of grammar, a question in the rules of grammar. And so I'm going to explain uh, some of it to you uh, here, OK? And so essentially, uh, as I said, uh, Sometimes a shiva is a shiva nach, sometimes it is a shiva na, okay? And so which one is it? So I'm gonna show you. So sometimes you have a letter, right? You have a, uh, there's, and so there's rules, when it's a na and when it's a nach. So there are rules for when it is a shiva na. So essentially, if you have a letter and beneath it you have a shiva, if it's the first letter of a word, it's a shiva na. It's moving. It, it would always be an e eh sound, be, ge, de, right, if it's at the beginning of a word. Uh, if you have a letter, even in the middle of the word, that has a dot in it, what's called a dagesh, and then underneath it you have a shiva, then that will always be a shiva na, because uh, with the dagesh, it tells, it tells you that that's how it should be pronounced. Uh, if you have a word that has two shivas in a row, Right? right, in the middle of the word, two shivas. So then the rule is that the first one is always going to be a shiva nach, right, which is a uh, resting shiva, right, essentially telling you it's the end of a syllable. And the second shiva will be the is sound, the shiva na, because that will be the start of a new syllable uh, in the word, right? So that's another rule. Another one of the rules is that if you have your, here you have your letter with the Shiva underneath it, and it comes after another letter. Now that other letter has its own vowel as well. And there are two kinds of vowels. There's what's called a Tinua Gidola and a Tinua Kitana. A long vowel, Tinua Gidola, or a short vowel, a Tinua Kitana. Uh, if a Shiva follows a Tinua Gidola, then it is a shiva na. So what is an example of a tinua gidola? Well, you guess it. One of them would be a kamatz, right? That's a tinua gidola, a long vowel. A short vowel, for example, would be a patak, right? Uh, just, the, just the single flat line, right? And that's a tinua gitana, and so a shiva following uh, a patak would be a shiva na. Uh, other examples of a Tinua uh, Gidola would be sometimes you have the E sound, right? Which you can do with the Khir, with the dot over here. But if you also have a Yud over here, that tells you it's a, uh, that tells you that it is a, um, a Tinua Gidola, a long vowel, and then the Shiva would be Shiva Nach. Uh, similarly, if you have, sometimes you have 
the O sound over here, right, the dot, um, that would just be a short vowel. But if you also have it with the vav underneath it, right, the cholom, right, then that's considered to be a tenua gidola, a long vowel, and the shiva would be a shiva na. Just like to uh, add in one extra point over here is that typically in uh, Sephardim, uh, pronounce the kamats as the same as the patach, uh, as just an ah sound, unlike Ashkenazim who distinguish between ah and ah. Uh. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, there are some instances where Sephardim do pronounce the kamats as an ah sound, uh, what they call not a kamats katan, a small kamats, but a kamats gadol. Um, and when a shiva follows a kamats gadol, an ah, sounding kamats, that, in that instance, then the shiva is a shiva nach, then it is a resting uh, shiva. Um, and so it, it can all get a bit uh, confusing. And so in some of the uh, new prayer books that are being published, uh, and in some tikkunim in the, uh, for people who are preparing uh, kriya for reading Torah, uh, they actually are distinguishing uh, with the kamats Sometimes it makes a, a bigger kamatz in the actual kamatz, and sometimes a shorter one. And so if it's the kamatz, if it's a, kind of the short one, it's kamatz katan, and it's just the ah sound. And if it's elongated, it's kamatz gadol, and it's an ah sound. Uh, and same thing with the shiva, so you don't have to get confused. When is it shiva na? When is it shiva nach? So if it's a small shiva, just two small dots, then it's shiva nach. Uh, and if it's two big dots, then it's a shiva na, and you know that it is the, uh, the moving uh, shiva. So all of the things are <laughs> to make it a little bit easier. So even if you don't know all the rules, um, you can still know uh, how exactly to pronounce uh, all of the words correctly. Be that as it may, uh, ultimately, this word matsu, of course, has a kamatz in it. And therefore, uh, according to the rules of grammar, it should be matsu a, with a shiva na. Uh, there was, though, a debate about what do you do if the emphasis is on an unusual part of the word? Now, what do I mean? Usually in Hebrew, the emphasis is on the last syllable of the word, right, which is called milara. Uh, and so that's like the word Torah, right? Not Torah, but Torah, not uh, uh, shab, Shabbat, right? But Shabbat, right? It's, it's on the last syllable of the word, right? So not the way Ashkenazim often pronounce words that are not grammatically correct, right? But the way Sephardim do it, or modern Hebrew, right? Which is, it's on the last syllable. Um, now you have some instances where the emphasis is actually not on the last syllable, but on the penultimate syllable, right? And that's called uh, mil el, right? Where, the, where it's gonna be earlier. And so the question was, is that if you have a situation of a shiva following a uh, tinua gidola, like a kamatz, in a word, which is mil el, where the emphasis is on the first part of the word, then Chazan Amosnino argued that in that situation, it would not be the regular rules, but it would be a shiva naf. And so he said here, where you have a hyphenated word, and it should have, and it's not just matzu on its own, below matzu, right? He said that, the, that it should be a shiva naf and should be below matzu, as opposed to below matzu. Uh, and that essentially was there. Uh, was their debate. Um, to add to the debate, Amostino said that in fact he had been a student in Amsterdam, he'd come from North Africa, but he'd been a student or from Gibraltar, from Moroccan family, he'd been a student in Amsterdam in Talmud Torah, Portuguese synagogue, and he said that's what they do there, that's what he was taught to do there. Um, and so Chacha Melba, who had come from Livorno, didn't know, hadn't been in Amsterdam, but he knew the rules of grammar and said that's, that's not correct, and he was a bit surprised but he figured he would find out. So he writes a letter um, after Pesach to um, Amsterdam to find out what in fact uh, was done in, that, uh, in their community. Uh, and we have the letter that they wrote back, okay? And so I'm gonna show you the, uh, the letter now that, uh, that they wrote to him, okay? And they write here a beautiful opening, right? To the excellent rabbi, most worthy of praises, from whose mouth our holy law proceeds, strictly adhering to its holy and uh, refined light, right? The Reverend Chacham Raphael Meldala. Okay? And here they write the following. They say, we write now to acknowledge that we've received a letter from you, the most reverend sir, and in which we find the real concern 
with real concern and regret that there are persons in your place who do not read correctly, who exalt that which ought to be depressed and depress that which ought to be exalted, both in the reading of our holy law and the other books of the sacred Bible, as also our forms of prayer, which we address to God Almighty and to continue in their own erroneous readings. They also assert that in the Portuguese congregation in Talmud Torah of Amsterdam, we read as they do, right? So not only do they read incorrectly, but they claim that we read incorrectly too, right? And in the conclusion of your letter, we see a list of some words uh, where they change the sound of some syllables, contrary to the received rules, which ought not to be done, right? And apparently he had given them a list of words where they're, he thought that Schazan was reading things incorrectly, right, in terms of emphasis. And he says, you therefore request of us to declare our sentiments on the subject and to write unto you the practice of our congregation to close the mouth of the adversary that he may not accuse us more, right? And he said, they sang, so essentially what he's doing is incorrect, and he's incorrect in saying that that's what we do as well. And here they go through with some of the rules of grammar that we've spoken about. And then they conclude in the following paragraph, uh, the, uh, the following. They say, um, uh, thus we are taught and we have the happiness to decide that in all the words which you have taken the trouble to collect, right, the shiva must be syllabical, syllo syllabical, right, however, however, that's, uh, however that's pronounced, which agrees with your decision. And besides, if it were not so, what difference would they have been between the long point and the short one, right? And so they're basically saying that you're correct about what you were saying. That doesn't make a difference where the emphasis is. If it follows a long vowel, it will always be a shivana. And so it is our duty to read them accordingly, he says, right? In ap the application of our forms of prayer, which we address to God Almighty and to the reading of our holy law, right? And he says, it's our obligation to pronounce words correctly. We can't just say, oh, God knows what we know. We have to pronounce according to the way the words are meant to be pronounced. And more especially, the chazan or public reader must strictly attend to them in an indispensable duty. And we are bound to read every word according to the principles of grammar as communicated by word of mouth and received from our venerable masters, right? The chachme misora, right? Those who taught us how to pronounce. I think that's what it stands for. And we must religiously attend to it with more zeal than any other authority. And if the Chazan does not attend to such, he will be of occasion, he will occasion much confusion and, he, and be instrumental to a great deal of mischief. But happy is the man who attends to the reading of his prayers and to the reading of our holy law as he ought to do, as we have received from our reverend masters. All this we write in compliance with your desire and to do away the calumnies which seem to have been raised against your, our practice and to furnish you with an additional power against those who are obstinately refusing to comply with your wish, right? They're saying, we're writing this because you've asked us to write this and we're, so we're happy to write this. Although you do not stand, as they continue, although you do not stand in need of it, as it is your decision, Reverend Sir, is quite sufficient. And we consider it merely an act of humility of yours to request of us a declaration of our sentiment on the subject, right? They're saying, you don't need us to say it. <laughs> You're qualified enough to rule this, but we'll do it anyway. And I may also add, and this is nice, right, that Mr. David DeSola, public reader, your son-in-law, right? He was the, said the second reader, all right, who's the son-in-law of the Chacham, who, so these rabbis say, who was my, my pupil in the Midrash in Amsterdam, knows very well the, con, the constant practice of our congregation, who read our holy law, and repeat our prayers according to the principles and rules of grammar, which with the utmost exactness. So they're saying, your son-in-law, the second reader, he's great. He knows exactly what to do. Um, we beg to conclude humbly, praying that the Almighty God be pleased to restore your health for many years in the company with your very respectable family. Right? And so they write this letter, uh, essentially supporting Chacha Meldola, both in terms of uh, what the rules of grammar should be, and also, in fact, saying that what what he thought was the correct reading is in fact what they do in Amsterdam as well, and that uh, almost Lino was, uh, was not correct. Um, now, it says in here that, that they furnish, and it should be matzu, right? And so they furnish in here, it says that he furnished a list of, of ways to read. Um, and in fact, um, I found, that, if not that list, another list that Chacham Meldala wrote in 1827. Um, I was just going through the archives of the community in the London Metropolitan Archives, looking at the Melda papers for something else. And I just happened to come across this and I, I realized what it was when I saw it. Um, and what he did was he ended up writing here a list of places in the Parashah 
on uh, Parshiot, where uh, presumably there had been disagreement about with this Chazan. So he wrote kind of, these are not every occasion of Shiva Nab. So clearly he just chose ones where he thought they were being done wrong and wrote where it should be Shiva Na. Um, he then does it also for the Haftarot, uh, times in the Haftarah, where I guess there was disagreement, and also in the Tefillah and the prayers as well, uh, as well as a few instances of not issues of Shiva, but just questions of emphasis. So, uh, for example, here with the word Anna, right, where we say Anna Hashem Hoshi Anna, right? So he says it's Anna, not Anna, right? So it's Mil El. So a few times where he talks about emphasis. Um, and he sent this to the Muhammad with a, and so we have a little note here from the member of the Muhammad who received uh, this list from, uh, from uh, Meldala, because he writes over here, he says, presented by the, res by the Reverend Chacham to the Muhammad on the 23rd of Tevet, right? So which is sometime after Hanukkah, right? 1827, so kind of the end of the year of this whole controversy, presumably before the next reading of Bishalach, right? Signed by the Gabai, and Montefiore, Moses Montefiore, right, who was the Gabai, the, the secretary of the community uh, at that time. Um, so great to, uh, to see his uh, handwriting there, right? And so this was presented to him, right? So that Chacham really went and kind of listed many places to make sure that it was read uh, correctly. In fact, the uh, Mahmoud instructed the Chazan to, uh, to read it uh, as such. Um, the, the story continues that uh, in the following year, I mentioned that the Chacham dies. And apparently on the first instance of reading the, uh, doing this reading of the Shirat Hayam uh, that uh, the Chazan had, he reverted and read it as Mutz U uh, again. Um, but <laughs> even though the Chacham wasn't there, his son was still alive, David Meldo, who was uh, also a scholar and was the Av Bet Din of the community, uh, kind of the head legal authority of the community. And he, he was very upset. He in fact posted the letter from Amsterdam on the door of the synagogue, and uh, the Chazan, you know, wanted to bring a case of uh, a libel case against him. It became a big fight within uh, the community, uh, and uh, ultimately it was presented to the Mahmoud again, who ultimately instructed almost, you know, that he had, even though the Chacham is no longer living, he has to uh, um, say the prayers in accordance with the Chacham's ruling, right, and must, going forward, read it as Matzeu. Um, what I think is uh, interesting about this episode is, of course, that it all surrounds this uh, episode of the Bitter Waters, um, where uh, there was obviously this conflict, and they, they, they you know, complained to God, cried out to God, uh, and ultimately the waters were bitter, and Moshe throws the, the stick in, and it sweetens, uh, it sweetens the water. Um, and uh, it struck me that maybe in this episode, you know, you have... Uh, talk about the miracle of the splitting of the sea. Um, but metaphorically, it's easy to split a sea, right? It's easy to have controversy, right? The, the, the real trick is, is bringing things back uh, together, right? That's not always uh, so easy to do, right? It's very e easy to have bitter waters, right? The, the hard part is to have sweet waters. Uh, and uh, in this instance, uh, Mahmoud seems to have understood that, right? That the controversy was not, uh, listen, even if you have real disagreements, that doesn't mean that should be public controversy with signs on the, the front of Bevis Mark synagogue, right? But that in fact, problems should be dealt with in an appropriate way, right? That ultimately we could have sweet, uh, we could have sweet waters. Um, and I think that's a real enduring message from this episode is that while they, they had a disagreement and they seem to have reasons, like questions of tradition, questions of uh, grammar, uh, ultimately, right, we need to find uh, sweet ways to uh, resolve differences perhaps not doing it in such kind of open warfare, uh, public uh, type uh, of ways. Um, and maybe this is why we always conclude the reading uh, of the Shirat Hayam with this uh, episode, uh, to say that the ultimate goal is not to have splitting seas and seas crashing down on people, right? It's very exciting, right, when you have these kinds of debates, but ultimately we want to have sweet water. We want things to be pleasant and to be uh, lovely uh, in, our, in our communities. Um, and perhaps that's the, uh, enduring legacy of the uh, Song at the Sea um, and uh, of this particular controversy in 1827, about not just the splitting of the sea, but the splitting of the S&P. Uh, some people uh, think that maybe this was a bit of a controversy of some conflict in the community, because almost Nino had been from Gibraltar, Moroccan, and there were more Jews coming from North Africa then, and 
perhaps there were some different customs between the uh, North African uh, Sephardim and the Spanish and Portuguese Sephardim, and uh, this may have been part of that. There are other episodes of conflict as well uh, during this time. Um, but ultimately, if we want community, you have to find peace. You may have people who are different, but you have to find ways to, to make sure the waters come together and that those waters ultimately uh, are sweet. Um, and so uh, I'll be reading this uh, in the synagogue uh, by myself uh, over, over the Chag. Um, and uh, while we are all separated, I look forward to when we can come back together and we can have sweet waters, uh, healthy sweet waters uh, together with all of you. So I wish everyone a Moedim Simcha, a wonderful last days of Pesach, and I look forward to uh, speaking to you afterwards. Take care and Chag Simcha.